Acts chapter 26, as you get your Bibles. You know, last week we had finished up 25, and you know, that was, that was actually, I was setting a record there. We had uh, chapter 24 we did in a week, chapter 26 we did in one Sunday, and something's going on because chapter 26, we're going to praise God and hopefully the creek don't rise, you know. God willing and the creek don't rise. We're going to actually get through all of chapter 26 this morning. So as I said before last week and the week before, hold on, here we go. In chapter 25 last week, we've seen Paul and he's being, uh, he's bringing, being brought back to trial again. He's in Caesarea, guys, still. He's still in Caesarea. He'd been held there for over two years. At first time, he was under Felix, the governor there, and he was brought for trial. But then two years later, there's a new man in town, is the governor Festus. And Festus now puts him, the Jews convince him, and hey, we got to charge him again. And they bring him back before him. And we read that last week. And then uh, there was no decision made, basically. After that, that time in that court, there was no decision made, made. But Paul made a plea to Festus. He says, I want to go before Caesar. I want to go to the highest course. The Jews wanted him to come back to Jerusalem, and we know they were going to kill him along the way and everything. But he says, I want to go to the highest of courts. And he was granted that. In verse 12 we read last week, where, where he said, to Caesar, you shall go. Festus gave him his wish, to Caesar you will go. You know, this uh, decision of Caesar, I'm sorry, of Festus's, it seems firm. It seemed like a firm decision. But then again, God's not done with Paul in Caesarea, right? He's not done with him yet. He introduces them to a new ear. And he introduces them to this, this man that Paul is going to speak about Jesus to. King Agrippa. King Agrippa had come to Caesarea to check out the new governor and see how things are going. And he's going to have this divine meeting with them. You know, I've talked about that before, church, divine meetings. And there are those divine meetings we have, whether we take that um, opportunity that is put before us or not. But those divine meetings, and I believe this one was too. King Agrippa had a desire. He wanted to hear Paul. He wanted to hear Paul, and I believe that was more than just happenstance. Again, like I say, I believe it was a divine meeting. I believe God had ordained this meeting with Paul and King Agrippa, and he's going to share his story. Again, his testimony, guys. He's going to share his testimony with King Agrippa. You know, so much, it's so crazy, because so much of what God does, so much, is beyond, so far beyond, church, than what it simply appears. You know what I mean by that? It's so much more than what it might appear to our human eyes as God is working. Paul's imprisonment had a purpose there. It had a purpose. Paul's imprisonment would further the gospel even while he was in prison, while he was held for, in Caesarea. You know, during Paul's first Roman imprisonment, his first Roman imprisonment, it was spent between Caesarea and Rome. Now, a lot of your Bible scholars and those, uh, those uh, men much smarter than me, they don't know, but these four books, four letters that Paul wrote, these four books were written during that time. Whether one of them was in Caesarea or not, whether he was in Rome all that time or not, but there was Ephesians, awesome book, Philippians, one of my favorite, Colossians and Philemon. Those four books were written. So Paul, Paul, he was busy and he had a purpose. Paul's imp imprisonment, like I say, had a purpose. And it had a purpose, guys, for the kingdom of God. It had that purpose for God's kingdom. This time, Paul's going to get a chance to speak to King Agrippa. And there again, for the kingdom of God. You know, last week I said, well, wasn't God wasting time? You know, he kept him there for two, two years and everything. Wasn't God wasting time? No, God wasn't wasting time, church. Of course he wasn't wasting time. He was going to use Paul right where he was at, right where he's at. God wants to use you. He wants to use each and every one of us where you are, wherever you are, church, in whatever circumstance, wherever you are. What? For his kingdom. That's why. For his kingdom. 
whether you're at home. There's those at home that I know have unbelieving spouses. Those that are not walking with the Lord. Whether you're at home, whether you're in the store, on the street, or even in prison. You know how many have been saved in prison? You know how many prison ministries have sought out and accomplished salvation in those? I know those that have been to prison. They didn't go in believing, but they came out. No matter where you're at, God wants to use you. question is, will you let him? That's what it boils down to. Will you let him? Will you be bold for Jesus? Will you not be ashamed to speak the name? This name of Jesus Christ, Romans 1.16, one of my favorite scriptures. For I am not ashamed, Paul says, of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. Do you guys realize that? The gospel is the power of God. What unto salvation for everyone who believes. Everyone who believes, that is how you got saved, by the gospel. It's the power of God. Stand up. Stand up. Don't be ashamed. Speak the name Jesus Christ. God will honor it. Amen? Let's pray, and we're going to go into our Scripture verses this morning. Father, I just thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that uh, we get an opportunity to speak your name as servants of you, that you saved us, Lord, that we might be able to speak your name. I thank you for that, Lord. God, as we study your word this morning, I pray that you will pour out your spirit upon us, that there will be those things that you use me to speak out that will touch those hearts, God, and change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the title of my message this morning is Stand Up and Get Busy, Church. Stand up and get busy. Didn't hear any amens to that one. Amen. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> oh, man. Like I say, Paul now, he's going to get the opportunity to speak before King Agrippa. And he's going to uh, speak of his experience about Jesus and with Jesus. Guys, go to chapter 26, verse 1. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. He's in this large group. You can remember that from last week. He's in a great big auditorium. And, and so he says, now you are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretches out his hands. And answered for himself. You know, I was studying. I got through that first verse. You know how that happens sometimes. And I'm, I'm looking at that first verse and I'm going, and he answered for himself. He answered for himself. Paul answered for him. He didn't let, uh, it's not what Festus said. It's not what the Jews said. It's not what somebody else was saying. He answered for himself. It was not what his neighbor said. Some of you guys might relate to this. It's not what your neighbor said. It's not what somebody at the store down here says. Right? For yourself. Paul answered for himself. Who are you in Christ? For yourself. 1 Peter 3.15, I use this scripture a lot. Why? For this purpose. Because it's very important in the Christian walk. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that's in you. It's your hope, guys. I hope it's your hope. Be ready to give a defense. Meaning, be ready to share it. Paul answers for himself. Verse 2. I think myself happy, King Agrippa. I love it. Happy. I'm happy. Because today I shall an uh, answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I'm accused by, my, uh, by the Jews. Especially because you're an expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. Now, as Paul was speaking... As he intros in here to Agrippa. You guys remember Tertullus? Do you remember Tertullus, that attorney who was a couple weeks ago and he went before Felix? And of course he was praising Felix. He was flattering Felix, right? Tertullus. Was Paul flattering Agrippa here? Was he? Like Tertullus? Absolutely not. Because he says, because you are an expert. The fact of the matter is, King Agrippa was an expert. He had been brought up in the faith. He knew the scriptures. 
He had much of the same training as Paul did. He was an expert. Paul was just noting the fact that this man here knows what I'm talking about. He knows what I'm talking about. Paul will later use, he's going to try to use, we're going to see it a little later here in the scriptures, guys, this head knowledge of Agrippa. Okay, this head knowledge is there with Agrippa. And he's going to try to reach his heart. You know, that's the toughest distance sometimes. You guys know what I mean. That's 16 inches, 18 inches, depending on how long-necked you are, I guess. But anyway, that is, a, that is a hard distance to reach. And he's going to try to reach from King Agrippa's head knowledge down to his heart. Guys, God speaks to our hearts. God speaks to your heart. Not that education, not that knowledge, not that seminary, not that Bible college, all these things aren't good. But you got to receive God with your heart. And when you preach God's word, you got to understand it in your heart. We can get caught up in our minds, you know, that analytical thinking kind of thing. Paul, well, once again, he's going to share his story here, guys, his testimony. And this time it's going to be for King Agrippa. But check it out. There's a place in there where I think he's actually throwing it at Festus. OK, as we go through, you'll see where it's at. Verse four. My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They know him. He was well known. They knew me from the first. If they were willing to testify, they just tell the truth, basically. That according to the strictest, of, strictest sect of our religion. You notice how he uses our in there? He's speaking to King Agrippa. He's saying our religion here. He's speaking to these Jews that are accusing him. Our religions. The strictest sect of our religion. I lived a Pharisee. I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise are 12 tribes earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I'm accused by the Jews? Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Boy, he's just speaking right to the king here, right? Why should it be thought incredible? Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, he's going to speak about his past life here. This also I did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, meaning I agreed with him. Remember Stephen, right? I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to uh, compelled them to blaspheme, deny Jesus is what he was saying. I compelled them to actually do that. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to the foreign cities. Paul lays out this portion of his life. Paul starts out his, his testimony again, like he has done previously in the beginning, stating how he was brought up in the strictest of Jewish traditions. Guys, he says, I lived a Pharisee. I lived that life of a Pharisee. By the strictest of the father's traditions, by the strictness of the law. As, as Paul is a Christian, and we see him as a Christian in the book of Acts, I can guarantee you he lived that life of a Pharisee much as he did a Christian. All in. He was all in. He wasn't one of these uh, hypocrite Pharisees. He wasn't. He lived the life of a Pharisee. To the T, every law, every tradition. He lived it. You know, many times when we hear the word Pharisee, or we read Pharisee, or we think about a Pharisee, we tend to put the word hypocrite right after it, right? We tend to, because Jesus slammed them in, in chapter 35 of uh, Matthew. I'm sorry, chapter 23 of Matthew. We're not going to go there. But there you remember Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. And over and over he talked about those things they were being hypocrite about. Paul wasn't like that. Paul was not one of those men. He lived as a Pharisee church. He lived that life. And we can see that in his Christian walk. That's what made him the man he was. It was that I'm all in 
attitude, you know? You go up to Vegas and you, you're playing that Texas Hold'em. I, I don't know, I've never done it. Never had that all in to push him. But you see him on TV and they go, oh, we're all in, you know, the big bad. That was Paul. He put everything in there. He lived his life as a Pharisee, guys. You know, there's many Jews today, many, many Jews, who profess to be Jews, right? You've ever been to Israel? Obviously, many, many Jews in Israel. Many Jews in the United States. Many Jews throughout different countries. Many that profess to be Jews, but they still don't follow the customs and ordinances of their faith. They don't follow it. You know, they profess to be a Jew, right? But they don't follow the ordinance. <laughs> you know where I'm going. There's many Christians. There's many Christians that profess Christianity. I'm a Christian. My dom, mom and dad were Christians. I live in a Christian nation. Yeah, I'm a Christian. They profess Christianity and they don't live it, church. Paul lived as a Pharisee. He lived it every bit, as much as he lived it as a Christian. Those Christians that just profess it, you know, they just profess it. You can't just say you're a Christian. Just because I say I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. You just can't say that. You know, I was listening to the radio, st start up the car this morning, and I heard this preacher say something. I thought it was cool, cool. One liner. So I'm going to use it this morning. I want you to know it's not my line. I got it from somebody else. I don't know who he was, but anyway. Jesus has a lot of fans. Unfortunately, not many followers. He's got a lot of fans. I'm a Christian. But not many that follow, that actually do it, right? You just can't say you're a Christian. Turn your Bibles, please, to 1 John. John states several places. We're going to be two different places in 1 John, starting off in chapter 2. And what people say. You know, what will we say? You just say it. 1 John, chapter 2, verse 3. He says, Now by this we know that we know Him. We know that we know Him. If we keep His commandments. Okay, let's start right there. Good thing for a Christian to keep the commandments of God, right? The greatest of commandments, too. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself, as Jesus said. By this we know that we know we know Him, if we keep His commandments. He who says, just says this, I know Him, and does not keep His commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word truly, the love of God is perfected. By the way, that's completed, guys. You don't get perfect. I'm sorry. You're it's completed in you, in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. What's the walk? You see, that's the difference. You can say you're a Christian. But the fact of the matter is, you got to walk the walk, church. 1 John chapter 4. Just turn a couple pages there. Verse 20. Here again, John states in verse 20. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. Anybody sit in that category? Don't raise your hand. If somebody says you're a Christian, but you hate your brother, what does Jesus say? What does the Word of God say? What does John say? You're a liar. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't say that to you. He did. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. There you go, guys. Word of God. If it's going home, if it's hitting right here, let it go deep. All right? Just let it go deep. It's okay. God loves to go deep in us. Amen? You can't just say we're Christians. You know, I, I love what James says in, in chapter 1, verse 22. But be doers of the word. This is the word, guys. 
Be doers of the word and not hearers only, because why? You just deceive yourself. You're deceiving yourself. I say I'm a Christian, but you're not doing the word. You're deceiving yourself, man. That's all. Fact of the matter is, those who are Christians, they know the difference. You think you're deceiving them? No, you're not deceiving them. You're just deceiving yourself. Paul continues on, as we read in verse 6 here. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. I'm going to be judged for this hope. I'm going to be judged for this same faith and hope, the promise of our fathers, those throughout the patriarchs of the Bible. I'm going to be judged for that, for this hope's sake. I'm a criminal, Paul said. This is the same hope of my accusers, by the way, King. These Jews out here, it's the same hope. Resurrection from the dead, the promised Messiah. Church, the Jews are still waiting for the promised Messiah. You know, they didn't accept Jesus. We know that. But it's the same hope. It's the same thing. Paul just found the promised Messiah. That's all. In verse 8, he says, why should it be thought? I love this. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead, King? Why should you be thought incredible? Guys, that, that statement is so relevant and relevant for the church today and relevant for your own life. Why should we think it's incredible that God does miracles? You realize he's a supernatural God. Do you believe that God created the heavens and the earth? Is there anything that God can't do then? Seriously. Why do we think it's so incredible when God does a miracle? Physical healings. Wow. That cancer, that tumor's gone. Wow. It's incredible. Providing for your needs. Shelter. Food. Warmth. Why do we think it's such, a, such an amazing thing? It's incredible, you know. <laughs> Changing hardened hearts. You know, that's probably the greatest miracle of God. Changing this man's heart right here. Wow, that was a miracle. And for some of you, probably the same thing. That was a miracle. God changed you. <laughs> wow. Hmm. Salvation of those loved ones that we'd say, well, they'll never be saved. Well, he's all he's got to do is change their heart, guys. And the miracle's completed, right? Resurrection from the dead. Why do you think it's so incredible, King? Guys, we can't ever put God in a box. You know that, that saying, never put God in a box in anything in your life. When you pray, I want to ask you, do you pray with expectations that God will answer your prayer? Because if not, you sure should be with that high expectation that God is going to answer your prayer. Do you pray with that expectation? We need to. Or do you doubt? Oh, well, I don't know. I'm not. This one's a big one. I don't know if I'll even give it to God. You know, this one's so huge. <laughs> do you doubt God? Do you, do you pray with that expectation? We have to pray with that expectation. Guys, turn into James. The book of James, chapter 1. I love James because James speaks a lot like Jesus. Straight into your face. Any of you that have, have uh, not comparing myself to Jesus by any means, but any of you have spoken with me one-on-one, -on -one, maybe a little counseling time or something like that, I like to speak it straight. I don't mean to offend, but sometimes what I say actually can offend because it's the truth. Right? That can offend some. But James speaks this way. In James uh, chapter 1, verse 5. You're going to doubt? You're going to doubt God? Chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all liberally. By the way, all, and he gives a bunch of it. Without reproach, and it, and it will be given to you. But let him ask in faith, no, without no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Don't be unstable, church. When you pray, pray with expectation. It's God's will, I know. 
God doesn't heal everybody I, I lay my hand on and pray over for healing, but he has. When I pray for healing, I pray with faith, without doubting and expectation. God will do that work. When you pray any prayer, pray with expectation. He can do more than we can imagine, guys. He's a supernatural God. Ephesians 3.20 Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above, guys, exceedingly and abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that works in us. By the way, that's the power of the Holy Spirit, guys. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead, he tells him. Paul now, he, down there in verse 10, he speaks about casting his vote. And I want to bring something up, just real quickly. He speaks about casting his vote in verse 10. He says, This also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in a prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. This proves that Paul was part of the Sanhedrin court. He cast his vote. During these times, he was the one that nodded, okay, stoned Stephen to death, right? He was part of the Sanhedrin court. Why do I bring this up? Interesting fact, to be on the Sanhedrin court, you had to be married. Paul was married at this time. As a Pharisee, he had a wife. Interesting. Means he was married. Now, later on, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians how he's a single man, right? We read that. As a Christian, then, he, be, he was a single man. So we could take one or two scenarios here. Either his wife died, passed away, we don't know, we don't read about it, or she left him when he became a Christian. You know, I almost have to think the latter, guys. I almost have to think the latter. I don't know why. But anyway, I thought I'd bring that up. But Paul, he testifies of who he was prior and the persecution that he put himself, right, himself upon Christians. You know, he basically says, yes, Agrippa, I was just like these accusers of mine out here, right? They're trying to put Paul to death. I was just like them, king. I was just like my accusers. But then something happened, and here's what it is. Listen on, you know, King. Here's what it is. This is the exciting part. Guys, I always love that about a person's testimony. Is where they came from important in that testimony? Yeah, it can be very relevant. It can be re very relevant. But sometimes, you be honest with you, I tell my testimony, and that's kind of depressing, man. <laughs> it can be depressing, too. But it can help you relate to those. The exciting part is what Jesus does afterwards. What your meeting was with Christ. That's the exciting part. How God changed you. Man, guys, that's the exciting part. And that should be the exciting part of your testimony too. Much like Paul. Verse 12, as he goes on with that. He goes on and says, While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, he's going there to round up Christians, right? He's speaking about the Damascus road. At midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise, stand on your feet, for you have appeared. I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well from the Gentiles to whom I know now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God 
and they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who give who are sanctified by faith in me. Wow. You tell me that wasn't exciting. I mean, think about it. If the Apostle Paul was standing before you, you're the king standing there. Tell me that wasn't exciting. Hey, this is what happened. You know, Jesus Christ came before me. Here in Acts 26, Paul gives his fullest account yet, guys. His fullest account of this time going to Damascus on this road. Paul's commission to the Gentiles. You know, we, we look at Acts in the previous there, and, and we see where Ananias gave him some information. This is the fullest account. That account, that commission to the Gentiles was right then, right before his Lord, right at that point. In verse 16, I found this interesting. Jesus told him, number one, he told him to rise and stand, to stand up. We're going to get busy, Paul. Stand up. He says there, uh, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness. A minister and a witness. Paul's commission by Jesus was first to be a minister. By the way, a minister, you can use the word servant, church. Servant. Ministers are servants. We are all called to the ministry, as the Bible says. Not necessarily teaching from a pulpit, but each and every Christian is called to the ministry to serve. To serve, church. Do you see all those kids in here this morning? You know that's only going to grow. You know that's only going to get larger. Do you know that those children need to be taught about Jesus? They need to be loved. They need to be taught about all those things of Christ. They need to have a full understanding why they come in here and do communion. They need to have this full understanding. Do you realize we only have two people right now that work in that children's ministry? They trade off. Minister. Sir. If you'd like to bless the children, if you'd like to have that time, I'm not talking every week. I'm talking maybe once a month where you go in there and you love on those kids and you, you help teach those kids. And you don't even have to teach them, okay? We've got teachers. You just be that assistant, right? And you, you love on those kids. Talk to my wife afterwards. She'll put your name down. We'll get together. We'll talk about it. He called him to be a minister, a servant, serving Jesus by delivering the message. That's what Jesus told him. You're going to serve me by delivering the message. Paul was called to serve the message. The message. The commission of a Christian is, to serve, is not that the message or the testimony of the message serves them, church. You understand that? It's not that that message serves you. We're called also to serve the message, to preach the gospel, to give it out. Called to serve the gospel, called to serve Jesus through that message. Second, Paul was called to be a witness. Okay, he's to be this witness of the things that Jesus showed him and would reveal to him. On down the road. Jesus has been revealing a lot of stuff to him, guys, all through the book of Acts. From the time of this experience on Damascus, he's been revealing a lot. He's to be a witness of the things of Jesus, that he would, that he would show him and reveal to him. The commission of a Christian is not to, I'm trying to word this right, is not to create the message or the experience but just a witness of that experience. You understand what I'm saying there? Just witness of what God has shown you and what He has continued as He reveals it to you. Not to try to create it. You're not trying to create it by, by, your, by, your, by your serving God even, okay? Just as God reveals it and as God shows you, share those experiences. Be that witness. See, Jesus asks us, asks us to serve Him through his message and to witness the experiences he shows us. You gotta, you, you can't tell me you haven't had experiences in Christ since you became a Christian. 
You know, you might think, wow, I don't know, that was a real little one. Well, wait a minute, is there really anything little in God's eyes? He showed you something. So that's what Paul did. Jesus told Paul then to rise on his feet. I put here, stand up and get busy. He told him to rise. It's time to get busy. Guys, we can't be a witness for Christ laying around, staying in our chairs, laying in our beds, waiting until the, you know, I don't know, two o'clock hour to be a witness. <laughs> you got to get busy. Rise and get busy. Verse 19, we need to move on. Yeah, we do need to move on. Therefore, King Agrippa was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, Paul says. I obeyed it. But declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and through all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting of repentance. Repent, turn to God, and do works befitting of repentance. Paul neatly summarizes this message to Agrippa, stating the same thing, guys, God still calls man to today. It's exact. You know, this message hasn't changed. There's an old saying, uh, if it's new, it's not true. If it's true, it's not new. That's exactly this. This is the same thing God calls man today. Repent. Repent. Turn to God and do works befitting of repentance. Repent. You know, many people say, well, that's turning to God. It's more than that. As a, as a new Christian, as a, as a brand new believer, it really means to change your mind. You change your mind about things. You change your thinking about things. As a brand new believer, you change your mind about God. You change your mind about Jesus. There was no God before I was saved. I was my own God, man. But all of a sudden, my mind was changed. Same with, same with our sin. You change your mind about your sin. Changing your direction towards God. Yeah, we go towards God and we don't, we don't go towards sin. But it's more than just changing the direction. It's literally changing your entire thoughts about God and about Christ. Church repentance you know, I don't know if it's not preached from the, the pulpit enough anymore. It is the most freeing experience anyone will ever experience. Because that repentance sets you free before the Lord. And sometimes even before others. If you have to repent to somebody else. As a new Christian, it's a freeing thing. As a Christian who falls into sin. Guys, you know what it's like to carry that. Oh, I got my secret sin, you know. I'm on my computer at home, and wow, and there's some stuff up there. That shouldn't be looking at that. But it's there. And that's that secret sin. You know what that feels like? Do you, do you have any idea of what the Holy Spirit conviction feels like? Because if not, you need to come after, after service and let me pray for you. Because you probably don't know Jesus. But that is it. You got that, that conviction. Repent. Be set free, man. Change your mind about that sin. Christian sin, we change our mind, right? Verse 21. For these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God to this day, stand witnessing both to small and great, saying, to no, saying no other things than those with the prophets and Moses said would come. I ain't spoken nothing, nothing new, dude. That the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead and will proclaim the light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Paul uses the word of God. Guys, use the word of God as your greatest defense. Realize God's word is your greatest defense. You know, do you believe? Do you believe? He's saying, do you believe this? King Agrippa, basically, he's telling him, do you believe this? Well, do you, you know, I ask you, church, do you believe the word of God? I sure do. You got to use that for your defense. He says, it's been written, king, from Moses to the prophets. Do you believe? Do you believe what you were brought up in, king? Do my accusers around me believe? All these Jews, right? Do they believe? Do you believe what's written in Deuteronomy by Moses? Do you believe what's in Isaiah and the other prophets? Do you believe this? Like I said, the question is for us is, do we believe? 
And that is to believe each and every word. And it's for you. I'm sorry, it's not a smorgasbord. You just can't take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and tear out the book of Peter. You know? <laughs> James and Peter, I'd like to exit them out of this Bible, man. You know, those things just hit me. <laughs> He uses the Word of God. Verse 24. Let's move on. Yeah, we'll make it. Now, as he thus made this defense. Oh, look what happens, guys. As he made his defense. He's telling them all this thing. Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you're beside yourself. Much learning has driven you mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. Wow. Wow, Paul. Festus crops up. And I got to tell you, he does what so many unbelievers do to us, church. He does exactly what those unbelievers do to us. You're crazy. You're mad. You're a Jesus freak. And they try to, they try to you know, make you look like a fool. Well, you're nuts, you know. You try to give a witness. You try to share the gospel. You're a fool. You're a Jesus freak. Trying to make you look like that fool. And boy, when there's a crowd like Festus had, right? When there's a big crowd, they'll even try a little harder. Make you look like a fool. Putting you down in front of others. <laughs> Church, do exactly like Paul. This is our application for life, okay? Do exactly like Paul. I speak the words of truth and reason. Don't be bullied into denying truth. To denying the truth. Stand your ground as a Christian. Stand up. Stand up. Stay standing. Romans 1.16. I mentioned it earlier, right? I read it. For I am not ashamed. If you're ashamed of the gospel, come up after service and let's pray. All right, we'll get you a little stronger in the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Church, speak the truth with boldness. It'll shut their mouths. It really will. You know, I had a story I was going to tell about that, and I'll share it another time because I see I'm, I'm running, going to run long if I, if I don't wrap it down. So just trust me. Speak the words of truth and reason. Stay with that. Now, I want to note something, too. You notice how Paul, he stayed calm with his defense there to, to Festus. You notice how he stayed calm? He, said, he, he treated Festus, too, with respect. Most noble Festus. He didn't get irate. He didn't get angry. He didn't try to pound his, you know, what, his reasoning into Festus. He stayed calm, and he treated him with respect. Church, that's important. That shows who you are. Now, Paul, he's going to try to make these words, what I want to say. He's going to try to make these words that he just spoke hit the heart of King Agrippa. He's going to try to hit him with the truth. Hit him with the, what he already knows is right. right. King Agrippa's right on the edge there. He's right on the edge of believing in Jesus. He just got to get past that, that head knowledge and a few other things here. Verse 26. For the king, before whom I also speak, freely knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention, since this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, he says, do you believe the prophets? Nails him there. I know that you do believe. He doesn't even let him get an answer, right? I know that you believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost, yeah, oh man, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would to, this is hard for me to read here for some reason. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and all together, such as I am. Basically, that you would become a Christian. I could pray that, right? Except for these chains. Hey, you, I don't want you to have these chains, man. That's how much I love you. I don't want you to have these chains, but I want you to become Christians. Paul's words, they hit home with Agrippa. He knew that Paul spoke the truth. Church, he knew that he spoke the truth. Why wouldn't Agrippa just confess it? Why wouldn't he confess the truth? Why? I'll tell you one reason. Festus sitting behind him, right beside him. Festus sitting beside him. 
What Festus had just said. Oh, if he had King Agrippa by himself, he might have confessed it. But that was one reason, was Festus sitting right behind him. Agrippa was faced with peer pressure. Of those around him and with Festus. You know, I, I, I did teachings for high schoolers, and a lot of times it was upon exactly that, guys. Peer pressure, peer pressure. You know one of the greatest examples of peer pressure I show in the Bible? Pontius Pilate. Three different times. Didn't he go before the Jews three times? Say, I find no fault in this man. Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. He was peer pressure doing something he didn't have to do. He could have released Jesus. It was peer pressure. Don't let peer pressure, and you think, well, that's only for youth. No, it's for adults too. Don't let peer pressure keep you from what, I want to say God has for you too, right? Don't let some peer pressure, what somebody says, don't let someone else have the power over you, church. Do you understand? You give them power when you fall to what they say, or you shy back from what the Word of God says. You give them the power. I've talked to some people in this community. I said, don't get other people in this community. Don't give them the power by you not coming to church. You know, well, you know, I got, they'll look at me funny. No, I don't care. Don't give them that power. Don't let someone else have the power of you and your relationship with God, church. Have it for yourself. Stand up. Get busy. The last two verses here. When he had said these things, the king stood up as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them. And when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves, saying, This man is doing nothing deserving of death or chains. Wow. Then Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Darn, darn it, Paul. Mm. Evidently, once you appealed to that high court, you appealed to that court of Caesar, there was going to be no coming back from it. That was it. You're going to go to Caesar. If he appealed to that by Roman law, evidently. Did Paul make a mistake here? Did he make a mistake? Was he, was, he, was he trusting more in that judicial system he was standing before? Or was he trusting more in God? Did he, you know, Paul make a mistake. Well, you know, you can look at it a couple different ways. But the fact of the matter is, is this decision by Paul was all in God's plan, church. Remember that. Those things in your life, it was all in God's plan. And God would fulfill his promise way back there at Acts 9 where he says, You will speak my name before kings and children of Israel, before the Gentiles. In Acts 9, 15, all those years ago back on Damascus Road. Guys, you realize this is close to now. I was trying to add it all up. It's close to 30 years since his salvation. That Paul has been on these missionary journeys and on and on, Jerusalem, and now there, it's getting really close to 30 years. And you know what? Jesus is still going to fulfill that promise. Amen? And he fulfills it in our lives, too. You know, sometimes I get so anxious about things. God makes promises, and he don't, he don't come back from them, does he? Paul is going to go. We're finally going to see him get on a ship. By the way, it's going to take him a while to get to Rome, guys. We're not going to do that in a week on one sitting, okay? It's going to take him a while. There's a lot that God can show us in his scripture then. But he's going to go to Rome, and he's going to bear Jesus' name. And Paul is going to stand up and get busy again. Amen? Amen. Let's pray, and then we're going to worship. And, and by the way, don't run off. we got a big old cake out there, and I realize if, if nothing else, take a piece with you, Okay? All right, good deal. Father, we just thank you for your word again. God, you are so wonderful, Jesus. Lord, your word is so for our lives today. Words written down 2,000 years ago, Jesus. And still, we find it for our lives today. You speak to us through your spirit. God, I pray that each, those words that, that you put through my mouth today, that they, would, that they did go out there and they reached hearts. And each person could take a little something, a little tidbit, or a lot of a tidbit, God. And Lord, if there's something that is, you're speaking to our hearts deep about, Lord. If you're speaking to our hearts deep about it, God, that we would just come before you. We'd give it all to you, Lord. We'd go all in. We'd stand up. We'd get busy for you, Jesus. 
And Father, we wouldn't take that as any type of condemnation. Lord, Your Word says there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. God, but You do want to change our lives. Each and every one of our lives. Each and every day. Thank You, Jesus. Praise You, Lord, as we worship You. In Jesus' name.